Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's conference. At that time, you may ask a question by pressing star 1 on your phone. I would now like to turn the conference over to Ms. Sue Swenson. Thank you. You may begin. Uh, thank you very much and good morning or afternoon wherever you are around the world. Um, this is our June board meeting and I'm happy to say that the theme that we'll be talking about today is continued progress. Um, you know, a lot happens between the board meetings uh, on an ongoing basis and I just think it's very encouraging for public safety to see the kind of progress that the personal authority and AT&T have made since we last got together. Um, a couple of those things, just for your edification, is that we have a significant number of agencies across almost all 50 states already signed up for the first net service. Uh, I think that's very exciting, and I think we're already seeing examples where that is making a huge difference uh, for the interaction, uh, both voice and data, between the agencies that they didn't have before. Uh, and they've had situations where, as a result, I think they've been more effective in their goal to save lives, not only their own, but the lives of the people that they're protecting. Um, additionally, um, since uh, I think you all know that we have a significant number of volunteer public safety professionals in the United States, uh, a significant milestone was our offering of subscriber pay. And this allows, obviously, for those folks who are paying for that service on their own and uh, qualified public safety professionals to actually sign up for the service. So um, so that's pretty exciting and a fairly unique offering, um, you know, in the marketplace today. Um, I think another important milestone, and I, I think something that was actually concerning to public safety in the early days was, are we going to have a number of devices that have become available to us because we're going to be such a limited offering? And uh, I think you'd be pleased to know that there are 31 devices approved and available on firstnet.com from a variety of manufacturers. So I think that concern uh, should be alleviated, and obviously there will be more to come, uh, but I think that gives public safety a lot of choice in terms of what might be appropriate for their particular uh, situation. Additionally, as you know, we have uh, early in the process launched the FirstNet application store. And we've made good progress on that. There are a number of applications uh, in that store. And there's a lot of work in the developer community and a lot of interest in developing applications that go in that store. Just a, a note about that, you have to be a FirstNet subscriber to actually subscribe to those applications. Uh, they go through a very rigorous review and certification <laughs> process. And, uh, and I think that it's important for both that public safety knows that these particular applications are secure and can be used uh, without concern. And last but not least, I think it's really important, it seems that um, we in the United States are going through a significant number of incidents. Um, they seem to be every day now instead of, you know, every week or every month. Uh, there's fires, there's floods, there's all kinds of incidents around the U.S. And the uh, opportunity to uh, distribute deployables for those incidents uh, is actually working quite well. Um, I was in a meeting, and uh, Neil will talk about it a little bit later, but I was in a meeting back in New Jersey uh, with AT&T talking about their deployables in the Network Operations Center. And um, there's a lot of work being done to coordinate the activities of the emergency operations centers that are become active during these incidents. You have local, you have state, you have federal. And and what can happen in that situation is that the, the assets are requested, the same assets are being requested from multiple agencies that activate those emergency operations centers. So there's active work underway to do better coordination around those asset requests so that those assets can be deployed more effectively to the people who need them. So, you know, that was, uh, that was really good to hear that that was going on. Still work to be done. It's a work in progress. But I think it just shows the amount of effort, energy, and focus that's occurring uh, for this initiative, both on the person authority side and at at t to make it better for public safety. Um, and so I, I just think it's very exciting that um, that all this is happening, um, you know, um, at a time when I think people thought it was going to be a couple of years before they actually saw the service available. So a lot of progress. Um, I didn't hit on everything that was done as a milestone, but just hit the high point. 
And I think it's exciting that uh, we're actually making uh, this amount of progress, frankly, so early into, into the project. Um, we've got work ahead. Um, obviously, there's some things coming up for the balance of the fiscal year. We've got a budget to, uh, uh, to work on and, um, and continued advocacy out there in the, in the field. Uh, we continue to have resources out there working with public safety, not only to talk about the first step solution, but also to help them think about how to improve their effectiveness and efficiency in, in their particular agency. So uh, work continues in that area. Uh, today we have a few updates from our key personnel at FirstNet. Uh, we're obviously going to take care of the minutes. Um, we're going to have committee updates from all of the committees uh, for FirstNet. We have Paul Patrick joining us for our PSAC update. We'll have an operations update, and then uh, we will conclude as we always do with an update from Mike Post, uh, our CEO. Um, so at this point, I think we're ready to start with the roll call. Uh, Karen, if you would be so kind to take the roll. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Sue Swinson? Here. Jeff Johnson? Here. Neil Cox? Here. Ron Hewitt? Here. Edward Horwitz? Here. Kathy Craninger? Kevin McGinnis? Here. Kip Osterholler? Here. Anise Parker? Christopher Pagoda? Richard Ross? Here. Richard Stanick? Here. Terry Takai? Here. David Dillette? Uh, David Dillette? For the record, I understand that David is on the call. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't know how to operate my mute button. So <laughs> Not the problem, I understand. <laughs> Thanks so much. Madam Chair, we do have a quorum for both the board and all four of our committees, the Government Personnel, Technology, Public Safety Advocacy, and Finance Committee. Right. So before we begin and proceed, I'd like to uh, state for the record that We've switched our um, conflict certification up a bit from this meeting, and this will be our process moving forward. But prior to participating in today's board meeting, uh, the board members all carefully reviewed the agenda, as well as the read ahead materials and the guidance that was provided by the Department of Commerce, Office of General Counsel, and our Chief Counsel Office regarding the conflict of interest standards that apply to board members. Uh, after completing their review, the board members responded to the conflict certification that was provided to them via I am email with one of the three reply options that were provided. All of the board members that are in attendance at today's meeting replied that they reviewed and understood the conflict of interest guidance and that they had reviewed the attached materials for the board meeting and that they do not have a conflict of interest. So I'd like to take that for the record and proceed without any refusal. Great, thank you very much. And thank you everybody for getting that information in a timely fashion. Uh, the one administrative issue we have to take care of prior to starting the committee reports is approval of the last set of minutes. I think you have those as part of your pre words, so I would uh, welcome uh, a motion to approve. Thank you, Tip. Second. Second. Thank you, Neil. All those in favor, you signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Abstention? Uh, any abstention or um, or uh, objections? Um, would you please make those available after today's meeting on our website? Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, starting out, I usually provide the update for the governance committee, but with us today is Marsha McBride from NTIA, and Marsha, uh, as part of her responsibilities working for us, Secretary Revel is working on the process for. Uh, looking at the submissions for uh, upcoming board openings. So, Marcia, we're glad to have you with us today. And the floor is yours to give us an update on where we are in the board process. Thank you very much. Uh, so, we have received 18 applicants, uh, applications for uh, the board seats. There are five open board seats. We have two requests for renomination. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done a preliminary review of those applicants and made a, a tentative set of selections for Assistant Secretary Reddle to review. Uh, after that, they'll go through another set of reviews mm -hmm. and eventually be uh, provided to the Secretary for a decision as to who will be selected for the board. Right. Uh, we are very hopeful that that will be done in a timely fashion. Right, right. 
and I know that you'll be involved in that and we'll work um, obviously with you uh, through this process. So yeah. appreciate the update. Any questions um, or comments from the board about that? Okay, great. Um, so that's really the update on the governance committee. Obviously an important part of the process this year and important as we approach the uh, uh, end of the fiscal year and the beginning of the next fiscal year. So look forward to, um, to work on that. Up next, we have um, Neil Cox and Mark G. Uh, <laughs> Mark and, uh, announced, I, I, I have in my mind that Mark, I'm sorry, I'm just going to call you Mark G. And uh, we have an update on the technology committee. And like I said, uh, I was fortunate enough to, along with a couple of my board colleagues, uh, visit the Global Network Operations Center in Bedminster, New Jersey. Uh, last month, and I think they're going to talk about that. So, you want to start, or is that going to start? Okay, no. uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as we had, we had uh, myself, uh, the Technology Committee, and several board members were invited to Bidminster, uh, New Jersey, to view AT&T's GNOC. Um, we were pleasantly surprised because it ended up being a whole day event where they had. Uh, invited also a lot of people from the first responder community there. And uh, we started out in a, in a kind of an assembly room where they talked about their commitment to this network, uh, what this network meant to them, uh, how it was being built, how it was different than others. And then we got a tour of the GNOC, which was absolutely phenomenal. Also out in the parking lot, they had a lot of the deployable assets that they were uh, showing and demonstrating on how they could be brought into uh, for certain events. So it was uh, a very, very impressive uh, day. Uh, it reinforced their commitment to uh, public safety and FirstNet on how they're going to build this network, uh, how it's built and designed, and uh, they actually brought in a couple of outside mm -hmm. speakers too to talk mm -hmm. about uh, uh, what what's important about the network of this. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a very impressive facility. Uh, they've opened it up, so anytime anybody mm -hmm. else wants to go, they will be, be uh, uh, welcome to host anybody from FirstNet to see this, but it is a uh, quite spectacular facility. And the thing that's amazing is the facility, especially when you get into hurricanes and things like that, they're able to predict things so far in advance to get the assets where they need to be prior to the event happening. I know, Ron, you're an expert on all this, but uh, it, uh, it, it was a very, very impressive uh, day. Hey, can I just make a comment? Sure. I, I think for those who haven't been there, uh, as Neil said, it's a very impressive facility, but what's impressive is their um, oversight of the entire global AT&T network. This is not just North America. This is their global network, and because of their predictive ability, and the amount of traffic that flows over their global network, um, our resources are co-located with the global resources. So we're going to get the advantage, instead of our people being cordoned off and kind of looking at a very narrow set of data, they're going to have the ability to see what's happening in the world. And because of uh, the high percentage, and I won't mention the percentage, but a very high percentage of internet traffic that goes across the at and network, they are able to predict a lot of things and prevent things from happening. I think we're going to get an advantage from that. Right, so. right. And especially, you know, where our core will be monitored, uh, uh, they can make these predictions and see. It's, right. it's amazing what, they, what they've done there. Uh, before I turn it over to uh, Mark Vanuszewski, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I got that right, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> Who's a, with FirstNet's Technology and Innovation Division, he's going to give the, the board a, a, an update. But I want to highlight a few things that, that Sue said earlier. And, and number one is that the we have a network that has its own dedicated core. And I can't, as a as a as an engineer of these networks and building them all my life. It's so important that that aspect of this architecture of FirstNet is to have our own dedicated core. It's, it's really, really the, the bedrock of what we're doing. So the core is up uh, and, and it is working. We're starting now to add band 14 to that core and, and all the other FirstNet customers will start to roll over to that core 
but I can't stress the importance of that. It's not some virtual private network or, mm -hmm. or some MVNO type thing. This is the fifth network in the United States. It is a dedicated core, a dedicated cellular network. It has its own billing and collections. It has its own network monitoring. This is an extremely, extremely important aspect of what we have. I mean, this is the network for public safety, and it's built to standards like no other network out there. And I don't know if we talk enough about that, but this network is built to standards like no other network out there. It's very important that, that we re remember that. Uh, as Sue indicated, there's now a list of devices that we have, and these devices are, are coming quicker than I think anybody anticipated these devices coming. Uh, we've got our, our, our uh, application store up and running, and applications, and this is what will really, public safety will benefit from. A network's a network. You've got the umbilical to make it. It's a wireless umbilical. But the application and the secure applications that public safety will be able to get at and how they'll use those applications, I mean, what made the iPhone were applications. You push a button. You push an, you push a, an icon. And things happen behind the scenes. That's what's going to happen for public safety. It's a databases that are a proprietary and secure. But because of what we have, and, and we have now in the laboratory, we have this thing set up, and our laboratory is starting to gain benefits. We're able to test these devices. We have working a working system that's part of the network in the lab where Mark and the team can test these innovations and see how, they, how they're going to perform within the network. And the, the last thing before I turn it over to Mark is that we're not just stopping at where we're at. We're starting to look at mission-critical applications as we move forward and go into 5G because this network will evolve, and that was part of it. We started where we're at today with 4G LTE, but it will evolve. It will evolve into, into 5G and mission-critical services where technologies will, will change uh, how first responders and public safety use it. I mean, it's, it's interesting. We set in on calls with the PSAC, and we will we will do uh, 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 listen to the PSAC talk, and they'll take uh, like a push to talk. And you look at where they're at today and their mindset. And one of the one of the interesting things that I observed by listening to these calls with with the people that are in the field, they talked about battery life. Mm -hmm. And and well, we've got to have batteries that go three shifts. Well, the reason they need batteries that go three shifts because the radios that they were buying today are five to six thousand dollars and yeah they share radios but the next generation technology is going to be a lot cheaper maybe a third maybe a half uh, maybe a tenth the cost so you don't really need to share it with anybody else it'll be the device and you don't need to worry about and you can keep the form factor smaller because you need the battery to go through a 12-hour shift and then it can be recharged so the mindset and what we bring as far as innovation from FirstNet and the Technology Committee and listen to what public safety has today, what they would like, and then we talk about other things and technologies and applications that enable a device to turn it off by like maybe a retina scan or facial recognition or some type of presence. So these technologies, and that's one of the things that one of the things we have with the laboratory, I'm going to turn it over to Mark now, they can usually test these devices and see how they're going to work. So with that, Mark, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thanks, Neil. And, and for the record, Mark Olaszewski is fine with Mark G. <laughs> 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 um, as, as Neil noted, uh, you know, this update will focus on the key results from the quarter, uh, as well as some of the forward-looking plans and milestones uh, we're working on uh, and working to achieve in the next quarter. As, as the first net authority worked with AT&T on the validation of the capabilities and functionality of the dedicated core. Uh, there were a series of checkpoints to demonstrate and test the breadth of services and capabilities to be available for public safety. When, the, when we briefed the committee back in March, uh, we were able to report successful completion of the first two checkpoints that are shown uh, on this chart. The third was completed in late March and the dedicated core was operational shortly thereafter. The first net core is the first ever nationwide LTE core infrastructure built specifically 
for our nation's first responder community. This core is dedicated to public safety. It's unique and delivers several key differentiating uh, aspects to it. First, it's a separate, redundant, and dedicated core. It's not a virtual core as a part of a commercial network. Secondly, it separates public safety traffic from commercial traffic, adding a layer of security, priority, and reliability. Third, it's a dedicated security monitoring of the network 24 7, uh, 365. And there are public safety dedicated ZEP to recover resources and response coordination. In order to ensure a seamless experience, for existing first net users, there has been a phased migration of existing agencies onto the new core. And along with AT&T, we are well into the planning of the next wave of features, services, and capabilities enabled by the new core. So there's been a tremendous amount of progress and key results in all elements of the network during the second quarter of 2018. As you'll noted, applications are how users experience the first net network and many of its benefits. There's new functionality and enhancements to all elements of the ecosystem. Emergency incidents need to be managed at a local level, which is why FirstNet's core has a local control framework that unlocks different levels of priority and puts control in the hands of local responders. Improvements in local control and the agency homepage, as well as introduction of an incident uplift feature were delivered. One of FirstNet's key goals is to enable continuous innovation for the benefit of public safety. An avenue for achieving that is the expansion and support of a vibrant app developer community. Recent improvements in the FirstNet app developer program, as well as focused public safety apps catalog. And, and I know we're all in the habit of calling it an app store. Um, it's been rebranded, re if you will, as an apps catalog. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Due to uh, their direct impact on public safety user experience, these new features and functions went through extensive validation, including involvement of members from the public safety community. We've heard from public safety that achieving a rich and diverse user device portfolio, including the most popular smartphones at commercial pricing, is vital. Band 14 adoption is ramping up and we've seen recent user device announcements from major vendors. We're also influencing the device ecosystem roadmap to be inclusive, public safety focused Internet of Things, uh, devices, sensors, <coughs> and accessories. As mentioned by both Sue and Neil, the initial NIST list of approved devices has been published. In fact, they've not been two iterations already, most recent being this past Monday. Uh, and the list now includes uh, 31 devices, including five that are banned 14 people. Right. The expansion of the radio access network has been enhanced through the completion of network sharing testing to ensure public safety can utilize existing non band 14 coverage with first that's dedicated and secure core. We have also completed quality of service, priority, preemption, and local control uplift testing to ensure public safety has full access to all network resources. Standards are foundational to all layers of the network and its architecture. During this period, our involvement in 3GPP standards contributed to the completion of mission critical services architecture in release 15. Uh, new elements include the interconnect between mission critical push to talk systems as well as interworking between mission critical push to talk and land mobile radio systems. In addition, we contributed to completion of the initial 5G core network architecture in the 3 gpp form. Finally, practically contributing to the new ATIS joint working group set up and working on the LMR side of interworking between mission critical push to talk and LMR. We continue to improve the operational maturity of the FirstNet Innovation and Test Lab Bowler with increased integrations, services, and testing capabilities. We are in the midst of integrating the ENOVs of two vendors in the Boulder Lab to multiple AT&T cores. The di this diagram illustrates the current internetworking between the FirstNet Lab and AT&T cores for both commercial and dedicated FirstNet environments. The integration of the first ENO 
EOD vendor has been completed. Integrating the second vendor is in progress and expected to complete this week. Successful calls and data sessions have been made for the lab to both production as well as testable. This level of integration is enabling the initial testing of overall network performance, which has been the vision of the lab and our role to focus on public safety specific features and functions. We're currently working to leverage the capabilities of our test equipment to begin maximum cell loading. This will enable the direct test and measurement of the impact of preemption of secondary users to the benefit of public safety primary and extended primary. Now the next step, we're on track to verify public safety end user experience under varying load, congestion, and coverage conditions. I hope that provides you some context and appreciation for what's been accomplished. Uh, it's been a real exciting period of progress and, and, and results, and I, we have time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, Mark, I have one question. So you use the term, and I'm not sure if everybody understands the term. I, I just began appreciating what you meant about a couple of weeks ago, the term uplift. It's not a term used in plastic surgery, I can tell. <laughs> so um, <could> <laughs> I'm sure it is used here. But how is that used in the, in the public safety world? Because it's important. Yes, yeah, thank you for, uh -huh. for the question. So uplift is the term that we're using that allows for the, the real-time um, yeah. increase in priority mm -hmm. of a specific user. Right. So that's one of the key requirements that occur consistently for public safety mm -hmm. is that depending upon an incident and who's involved, mm -hmm. that it may be necessary if there's congestion in the network mm -hmm. or if an incident commander wants to just ensure mm -hmm. that a particular responder has priority access to resources, that user's priority can be uplifted or okay. increased to the top level of priority okay. so that they have, you know, uh, you know the, the top level uh, priority to access any resources they may need, whether that's because it's a responder down mm -hmm. or whether there's perhaps some streaming video that's mm -hmm. important to get back to a, to a command center mm -hmm. coming from a particular responder that responders priority can be up. And that's how we use the term. I would just add, um, specifically for extended primary right. users, one of the key commits to this tool is um, they can uplift those extended primary right. users to primary for specified time periods. Right. So does that have to be like uh, transportation, transportation or exactly. animal control yeah. or something like that, and the instant commander has that ability to uplift them into that level of priority. That, that's correct. Okay. That's it's just a term that, you know, sort of gets thrown out that I wasn't sure if people really knew what it meant, and it's just such a unique and important characteristic of the service. So. Right. It, that is that is a unique capability of this offering exactly. that isn't available. Anywhere um, else. Anywhere else. Yeah. So it's a big differentiator. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments uh, from the board? Thank you, Mark. Uh, a lot of progress. I know there's still a lot underway, so we'll look forward to the next report next quarter. So uh, thanks for thanks for the work you do and the work of the entire team. Because I know it's uh, it's demanding, and public safety keeps pushing you guys for more and more. So I appreciate it. You know, um, understanding uh, what we need to do in the labs and from a technology perspective is often determined by what is the you know the end user really want, and obviously staying close to public safety has been important to us not only from the beginning of time, but it continues to be important. So I'd like to uh, I'd like to turn the next committee report over to our vice chair, Chief Johnson. Um, and Chief, I'm sure you have a few things to say about this, as uh, it's near and dear to your heart. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's a pleasure to be on the call with everyone today, and. Uh, Neil, I want to just thank you for talking about why the FirstNet network is, is in fact unique and different from many other offerings. Uh, as a as a person who spent my career responding, uh, that there are uh, there are lots of offerings out there that are that, that frankly are not as good as what public safety demands. And I really, uh, I think it is part of our job here at FirstNet to differentiate uh, or to talk about the differentiation and to make sure that public safety understands that. And in part, right, that's what public safety advocacy does. And there's frankly no 
probably greater uh, example of how the FirstNet role is evolving and transitioning. In public safety advocacy, we spent our early uh, days and years reaching out to the associations and making sure that the public safety associations and, and their allied groups, that they knew what we were up to and that we were listening uh, to what was important. And now we're evolving, uh, now we're evolving down to more of a street level communication. Uh, I hear it pretty often that uh, person X or person Y that's a captain here, a firefighter there, they don't know anything about FirstNet. And, and there, you know, that does actually make sense to us because that hasn't been the primary audience we've been reaching out to. But that has evolved and changed, and that is now uh, our primary audience because we have a FirstNet network deployed nationwide. It, uh, you can buy it today and subscribe to it today. And so now our messaging has changed, and so is the group that we're talking to. Our public safety advocacy team is focused on identifying the current and future common needs of public safety, and this is through our day-to-day -day interaction with them at their annual conferences, at the association level, and where we may find them. And it has a routine happening that public safety is reaching into first net and saying, we can really use you here as a keynote speaker. Here is a second group that, uh, who has a predilection and an interest in technology, and uh, in, we need the technical folks there. And that's what public safety advocacy does, is that we share the information about FirstNet and make sure that responders know what we're doing. Uh, we also do a lot of listening out there. We make sure that the information we gather um, comes back to FirstNet and comes back to our partner at AT&T, who's actually constructing the build out of the FirstNet network. And we bring back feedback on what kind of applications we need, uh, what kind of design do we need in the products uh, that, that we or they are supporting. And then, of course, we help and promote the adoption of FirstNet because there is only one nationwide network uh, for, for dedicated to first responders, and that is FirstNet. Um, I saw many of you uh, at the CSCR and in San Diego. Um, I, I want to thank the board for investing their time there. It's astonishing what, what a great job that Derek and his team at NIST do. Um, it wasn't very many years ago where there wasn't a PSCR, where we talked about public safety communication and public safety research. Um, and now uh, that is probably one of the largest conferences I go to a year. So for anyone out there that's listening and you have a tech, uh, technology bent, I would definitely put PSCR on my agenda of things that I want to do because that's the place you're going to hear speakers and representatives and our stakeholders talk about technology and the innovations and see how these things are developing toward what public safety needs in the field. And I think probably lastly, um, you know, there will be more engagement as we move forward. Uh, and these are often the FirstNet AT&T as well as FirstNet of the Authority. These are often done in conjunction with one another, and we will always try to work with uh, uh, FirstNet AT&T. We will always work with them to try to make sure we have the right people there. So enough uh, for me. I, my pleasure to turn it over to Amanda, Amanda Hilliard, who will talk about their plans for the remainder of 2018 and what we've been up to. So with that, Amanda. All right, thanks, Chief. Appreciate the introduction. I'm filling in for Dave Buchanan today, who is on a well-deserved <laughs> vacation with his family this week. Um, I think the Chief did a great job of describing the evolving role of our advocacy team. We shift into this operational mode and kind of pivot the word Dave used last time from to focus on the 56 states and territories to um, more of that, that agency level, the 60,000 plus agencies. So I'm going to take a couple minutes to highlight a few recent engagements that, that our team has been participating in, the vast amount of engagement, as well as some use cases, which is really exciting, um, where we've seen first set in action um, since the last board meeting. I'm also going to highlight a few areas of coordination um, with the AT&T product team, where we've been feeding them um, some feedback, and they've been taking those recommendations to heart and making some adjustments. So I wanted to highlight a few things there, and then we'll just look ahead for the, the next quarter before we meet again in September. Um, so since the, the last meeting, we, we participated in over 300 uh, public safety engagements, reaching over 10,000 stakeholders. Again, we try to focus across all levels of government, all disciplines, 
Um, you see the, the chart here on the slide that lists some of the types of engagements we're doing, and then just a couple of examples that you can kind of see that, that um, breadth of various public safety audiences we're, we're working with. Um, we're continuing to, to leverage and expand those relationships that we've um, built over the last several years, as well as developing new relationships. Um, I'll note we, we still have, are primarily focusing on education and outreach at this point. There's a lot of misinformation that's out there and some confusion in the marketplace right now. So um, as the chief alluded to, we're, we're, act, we're still very much needing to do that education and you know, awareness campaign. And as you mentioned, in, in many cases, we're doing that hand in hand with at and with our partner. In some cases, you know, we're each doing it separately and, and kind of keeping in touch about who's covering what. And I would say generally that um, those relationships between our, our field team and the, the at and um, sales counterparts have been really positive and we're leveraging um, those relationships. Um, but I did want to note while we're you know, executing you know, mostly education and, and awareness events, we are actively working to develop a more agency-focused um, engagement program to focus you know, with individual or, or multi-agencies um, to conduct more in-depth engagement. Um, to either prepare them for adopting FirstNet or if they have subscribed, um, to really get them to further you know, take advantage of all the capabilities we're making available. And when I say adopting FirstNet, it's not just becoming a subscriber. There's so much more there um, that we want to make them aware of and really sort of understand their, their needs. Um, we're also looking at a, an after-action um, engagement, and this is something that, that a Ron group at the Office of Emergency Communications is doing that, that we want to partner with and leverage with a discussion, I think, a month or two ago about that. Um, but essentially, you know, learning from some of these incidents, whether they're on FirstNet or, or not, how they're using um, wireless broadband today, and, you know, how that's working, and, and where there's some areas for any So the next slide, I, I just wanted to highlight on a couple of specific examples of some of those 300 engagements. And I'm not going to do it justice here, but um, the first one I wanted to mention, uh, Mike, the opportunity to do the, the keynote at the AFCO Public Safety Broadband Summit. That's the annual event they have been doing, I think, since before the creation of FirstNet. Um, so it was exciting this year. He got to use his keynote to, to focus on um, the support that, that FirstNet provided to the Boston Marathon. Um, 80 FirstNet devices were provided there to police, fire, and their incident response team. Um, 30 of those were connected to the FirstNet core, so they got to test that out um, this was back in April. And they had a push to talk and LMR integration applications that they were using. So um, it was a great opportunity for Mike to, again, highlight FirstNet in action. Um, we have a video out on our website. There's a blog um, where you can hear directly from uh, the Brookline Police Department on, on that experience that they have. Um, and this was an event where we did it hand-in-hand -hand with at and We had um, a panel where they were there as well, again, just um, talking about what's available today and, and the excitement in the community. Um, last month, we participated in a technology conference with the International Association of Police Chiefs. Um, that's another one we do each year. And again, uh, and this is the, the picture there on the bottom left, you see our, our law enforcement advisor, Harry Markley, speaking to a room full um, of responders there. A really exciting conversation there around the first net connected you know, next generation officers. So, um, and then the last thing I, I wanted to highlight, I, I talked about some of those agency engagements, and that's where we're kind of looking to, to do more of um, later this year and into next year. Um, we've done a pilot last, I think, a month or two ago with Phoenix um, Fire. And again, sitting down with them, you know, spending almost a full day with them to really understand um, how they're using broadband today, you know, what additional needs they might have, and essentially, in this case, helping them to um, prepare for FirstNet adoption to better understand all these capabilities that, that are available to them today or, or will be in the near future. So again, look forward to, to sharing more of those types of examples um, in the coming board meetings. I think, um, I wanted to take a minute. We're going to showcase a video that our um, our great comm support, you know, works closely with our, our field team, in this case, Mike Barney up in Region 1, um, to pull together. And this video is going to showcase um, a recent event in Rhode Island, the Volvo Oceanman, um, where, again, there were 30 FirstNet devices all connected to the core. Um, and they're going to talk a little bit about how they use FirstNet to enhance their situational awareness. 
And Amanda, as I have my fingers crossed that technology works for me, I do want to make a note that this will be posted on our website separate from the presentation material so that the public will be able to view it um, following the meeting as well. Right. We have seven boats that have been racing around the world. It's the only North American spot. We have a large crowd that comes to this small park that the boats are at in Newport. And our job with safety wise is to basically make sure it's safe for all the people coming into the venue, as well as people that are watching the marine side of it when they do the import racing and then when they go part on Sunday. So in the past, being able to communicate all the time with some of the other public safety entities, we didn't really know where people were a lot of times in the venue area when something happened. So we try to take some of the, the new technology that's come out from FirstNet and apply it to this event. And the tracking has been of the public safety entities in the venue has been great for us on a situational awareness problem. We had to move people to certain locations when people got hurt or if there was a vehicle in the place where it was supposed to be, we were able to send the nearest people there instead of trying to figure out where everybody was at. Just like yesterday, we had, in a particular venue they have down there, it's a national mock-up of one of the race sailboats. So we had an individual fall off that. Immediately, the way it was, they, they were able to get a hold of EMS right away as they went to the push the talk. They were able to call our DMAT team that was on scene. They dispatched the gator. Now, again, there's 10,000 people down there. So the public safety person boat was actually able to talk to the push the talk and get the medical people right to where the person was at. So it worked great because we could watch them where they were. So when the public safety person called us and said, what's their ETA? And we said they're about a minute away from them and they're coming around the corner of the port right now. So we knew exactly where they were like every 30 seconds. So that made it a lot easier for us to explain to him, help's coming, it'll be there soon. This is where they're at. And meanwhile, keeping the other medical assets where they were, if something else happened. We've been using them for sharing information, set up talk groups, and then all individuals based on you know where they belong in that group are assigned to groups. So you can get one-to-one -one, uh, individuals, or you can get to specific groups. Uh, we have a law enforcement group, a five EMS group, an all call group, and an emergency management group. So a lot of great aspects of, uh, of this device. And this is our first time using for seven. Yeah, so, so we appreciate the, the partnership with uh, the folks there in, in Rhode Island. And again, as, as Karen mentioned, um, this video will be posted to our, our website or YouTube, YouTube channel uh, later today as well as a, a blog. Um, so again, we, we've got the Boston Marathon one out there, this one, and then there's also, um, just earlier this month, there was a, a person that responded to the Western the storms in Western Connecticut. So again, there's a, a blog and a video on that. So I encourage everybody, if you haven't checked that out, to take a look at those. Uh, video, some great work there. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about is, is just a couple of areas where we're coordinating closely with, with AT&T um, on the product side as well as um, with the t &I team. I think it's, it's been great the, the public safety expertise that our team brings, team with the technical expertise that, that Mark's team has um, to really pull together some, some great recommendations to um, further enhance some of these great products that AT&T is pulling together. Um, so Mark already talked a little bit about the local control portal, which again is, is available to FirstNet subscribers. Um, he talked about that renaming of the uh, uplift response tool, and, and that really came from feedback that our, our team has provided um, after seeing a demo of the tool and, and you know really understanding it. Um, we thought the name change and provided some help around messaging um, to really make sure that, that people understood what that tool was and what the capabilities were. Um, our team also supported um, extensive user acceptance testing for the network status tool, um, which resulted in some improved usability and, and appearance of the content um, displays and alerts. And um, I think that that tool is definitely a differentiator for the FirstNet service, and we look forward to you know, engaging more with the public safety community more broadly um, to enhance that tool over time. Um, we also spent time reviewing um, the, the documentation that AT&T has on user eligibility. So this is how, you know, when they're out doing sales, they determine whether a customer is eligible for primary status or extended primary. Um, so we, again, use the, the discipline experience that our team has to review that and provided some feedback um, where we, you know, suggested that some tweaks be made or some additions be made, and that's been really well received. 
Um, and then the last area I wanted to mention is around mission critical services. So um, we did a recent engagement in Texas, and always want to say thank you to Todd over Burley, who is you know willing to have frank and open discussions with us too. Um, went out and met with a group of public safety in Texas to talk about the priority level mm -hmm. and get some feedback around, um, you know, best practices in, in implementing those. And we're going to be doing another similar engagement um, in Kansas next week. So that's been really, really uh, helpful. So again, just wanted to note, really great working relationships there. Um, we've been, as, as uh, you'll hear from Paul and, and as already, Neil already mentioned, um, also working to keep the feedback informed of all these you know, new products and services that are being made, being made available and, and help address questions and take that feedback that they provide. Um, so we really have a great relationship going there. So the last slide I have just, just highlights um, some of the upcoming engagements we have for the summer. Again, there's, there's a lot more than this, but just a, a couple. We wanted to just show the, um, again, show the, the breadth across, across the local state, federal, tribal that we're engaging with as well as the, the discipline. Um, I also wanted to note that we've um, had discussions with, with all of the spots that, that are um, taking advantage of that LIPT 2.0 funding. Um, so we just wanted to note we always appreciate that collaborative relationship with Marsha and, and her uh, LIPT team as well as the spots um, to, you know, just determine how we best use those funds over the next um, two years to continue to um, work for implementation the first time. So that uh, concludes my update. I think, again, looking forward to in the future showing you more of these use cases and examples where we're seeing first time in action. It's very exciting. Yeah, that, I, I mean, it's terrific. I think it's, it, you know, when you see a video, it's so much better than somebody telling about somebody coming around it. And hearing from the actual users, I, I think the more we can do of that and share it, you know, across the public safety community, I think the more effective it can be. So I appreciate all the work that the team's doing, you know, with our team and at and I think that's important. I do have a couple of questions. Can you talk about the agency engagement? I think that's terrific because it's really sounding like people who are the real users are getting in a room and talking about how to really optimize the use of the capability. If I were listening in today and I wanted to have an engagement like that, how would I go about doing that? Because I mean, do people sure. request it or, or yeah. how does that work? Yeah, so we're still <laughs> developing the program. So okay. We haven't, you know, actively gone out okay. and You're not advertising it. We're yeah. not, yeah, <laughs> advertising a little bit, free advertising it here. But they could reach out to their um, regional lead okay. and right now to talk about that mm -hmm. or to, to kind of get a glimpse of what's coming. So uh -huh. the Oval Ocean race is a great example. It's always great to see a master chief, uh, yeah. retired Thomas <laughs> Gasoline, and uh, uh, from there he was uh, retired <laughs> chief in the Coast Guard. But, right. but with that, he is the SWIC for Rhode Island. Right. And, and whenever you have a major planned event or an incident, you follow the National Incident Management System, Incident mm -hmm. Command System structure. Right. And underneath that is the communications unit. Okay. And we've had a great partnership with Amanda and Jeff on updating the curriculum for the communications right. unit to include FirstNet. Nice. In the past, it's been strictly land mobile radio mm -hmm. and, and what channels on, on right. uh, your radio do you talk. And now we just, and, and uh, uh, Vice Chair Johnson will be happy to note that uh, earlier this month in uh, Fairfax uh, Fire Training Facility, they alpha tested the first uh, uh, information technology services leader course, ITSL which actually will now uh, be an integral part of the incident command, forming the incident commander on yeah. first net capabilities and how to get an optimum uh, benefit out of that. So it's all being brought current with the current capabilities. Exactly. Because again, incident commanders right now only have people that are trained on LMR, right. and now they're going to be trained on also on first net capabilities. In addition to that... Yeah, that's awesome, Ron. That's awesome. Yeah. In, in addition to that, if the incident gets too big mm -hmm. and you need assistance, it's called the emergency support function number two, communication, mm -hmm. which is the ability to flow in resources. Mm -hmm. uh, as Neil mentioned, FirstNet has that disaster capability, right. and we've already had two meetings working with Amanda and the team on with FEMA uh -huh. to and ensure it's integrated into the national priority That's to get right. them. Because when you get there, you may need road access, mm -hmm. you need transportation, right. security, all those other aspects. Right. And now that can all be coordinated in a coordinated area to make it even more resilient. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I'm not familiar with the whole incident command structure, are there other uh, structures that need to be updated with FirstNet other than what you've mentioned? Or are there still some to be done? That incident command system that is, that is, that is, that is, is the structure. So it's fair to say it's all updated now with FirstNet information. I'll add a little flavor. Okay. We've had you know several of our staff do search and rescue and other activities yeah. in, in their fun time mm -hmm. or do that uh, outside work. Right. And we've had them plugged in for the last couple of years on updating this curriculum okay. to include a broadband component right. uh, in addition to the narrow band that was really covered within that structure. Right. But now we're bringing the new capabilities, how they use broadband, and some of the examples shown in the video Excellent. for that to move forward. And it's not done yet. They're okay. still working on updates to that going forward, but right. we're You're directly involved in the alpha the the court, and it's going right. forward. The beauty of this, all incident commanders now will have training on that person. Okay. Case. Several of the PSAC members are involved, as Excellent. well as some others, to update this incident command structure okay. to take advantage of it. Good. You know, uh, uh, go ahead, Chief. Yeah, Madam Chair. I, I, I think uh, it's, it's worth noting for our industry members and, and the folks listening that in public safety, it is one of the very rare and few examples I can think of where there's one way to do it nationwide, police, fire, and EMS. The National Incident Management System, or NIMS, it is one way nationwide. And okay. if you're in any of those disciplines, then you have to know and, and understand that uh, in order to do your job. So there is really one way. And this is an enormous move that the Admiral's talking about is, this is an enormous move and an improvement uh, to them. And uh, th there is a military equivalent to this, uh, and yep. we're learning from that. That's great. That's, I appreciate the update, yeah. That's fantastic. So it's great that we, you know, we were at the state and kind of governor level for a while. Now we're at the agency level. Um, I have the good fortune of meeting some folks that are getting information out to end users. Uh, Chief Johnson introduced me to uh, a group that actually does this primarily for fire, not so much for law enforcement, but it's getting out there. And I think that's a challenge for us that, you know, and, and I think all of us need to think about how can we be more effective in giving the information to the actual practitioner. So I think we're, I mean, we're coming down the levels, but I think there may be at least an initial methodology and so Amanda I'll talk with you about that. Um, so they just met with the folks last week. They were happened to be local in San Diego, so it was convenient for me. You mentioned it to Mike. Uh, but I think that, you know, with our capability of, <clears throat> particularly on video, because that's a good way to consume information versus having to read something, and you know, kind of read it, and doing it pretty concisely, I think is an opportunity to, to explain, uh, as Chief Johnson said, there's a lot of practitioners who've never heard of first that. So, again, it's our continuing effort to do that, but I think that's another layer we, we need to look at. Um, and then I love the... Um, the description, I, when I was watching that little golf cart or the whatever it was, it reminded me like the Uber of public safety, right? <laughs> you get to see where your little car is. You know, the gator. Yeah, exactly. The gator. The gator. But I mean, it's that, that concept, and Richard Johnson talked about that in terms of understanding where all the, you know, the rigs are coming from and how close they are and which ones are arriving first. And, you know, these are things that, you know, because in our personal lives, we see that. But in public safety, they don't always have that capability. So it's kind of exciting to see all the ideas that are coming out as a result of, you know, people starting to use it and what we're going to see more and more of that. So any other comments or questions? Uh, nice work and uh, great to continue to be out there. Like you said, you know, there's a lot of um, misinformation going out there, so obviously getting the facts out so people can make an informed decision, um, you know, is obviously important for the safety and certainly the role that we can play here. So great job you. Thank you so much. Um, I think somebody mentioned that we were in San Diego, was it last week? <laughs> it kind of gets blurry, but we had the public safety commercialization research last week, and had a, a, also at the beginning of the week, we also uh, had our PSAC meeting, and had Paul Patrick with us today, who's the chair, interim chair of the PSAC, and uh, Paul, I have to say that um, that was probably one of the best PSAC meetings we, we've had to date, so uh, look forward to you. Um, updating us on what's going on with the PSAC and the kind of evolution you're going through. So, welcome. Thank you, and thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, I agree it was a great feedback from members of the community. Paul? Oh. Paul, oh. oh, I think you're cutting in and out. You're cutting. How are you doing? Is that better? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Is that better now? 
Yeah. Okay, good. So anyway, yeah, thanks, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the comments, and uh, uh, it was a wonderful meeting. As you can see on the next slide, since our last we last spoke in March, uh, we've added several uh, new PSAC members, four of them to be exact, Blake DeRoshi from the National Association of State 911 Administrators, Major General Arthur Logan from the Governor's Homeland Security Advisory Council, Daniel Henry from the National Emergency Numbers Association, and Chief Mike Dyke from Metro Chiefs. Chief Dyke has also joined us as a P on the PSAC Executive Committee, replacing Chief Niles Ford, who unfortunately had to step down from our Executive Committee and from the PSAC. But I want to extend our sincerest appreciation to Niles. He did a lot of amazing work over the few years that he was on the PSAC and on the Executive Committee and helped us to get to where we are today. So great thanks to Niles for the work that he did. Also in regards to the Executive Committee, for those of you who may not be aware, in, um, we also appointed uh, Todd Early from the National Council of Statewide Interoperability Coordinators and Brian Howard from the National Congress of American Indians in March to the uh, Executive Committee. Uh, I need to thank Sue and Jeff for their support and also grateful for Todd and Brian for their willingness to step up and take on additional responsibilities. Next, uh, the, we held, as was mentioned, as Sue said, we held our uh, in-person meeting. I can't control the clicker on the slides. But on the, Got it. Uh, <laughs> next, we held our in-person meeting uh, in, on June 4th in San Diego, California. Uh, the day before PSCR, I was pleased we had over 30 members of the PSEC that were in attendance, as well as uh, many of the board members. We're grateful that Sue and Jeff and Neil Cox and Ed and Kevin McGinnis were there, and they stayed with us through the entire meeting, and that was much appreciated, as well as uh, FirstNet authority leadership and staff and leadership from AT&T. Uh, were there. Mike was there, pulled through almost the entire meeting, and that means a lot to our members to see such a great support from both AT&T and from FirstNet Authority and from leadership there and from the board. Uh, at our full day meeting, we covered a wide range of topics um, of particular interest. The PSAC discussed uh, on interplay between the key ad interplay be between the key advantages of FirstNet. Uh, built with AT&T. We also learned more about marketing and we learned a lot about branding efforts. For some of us in the um, uh, rural areas, it's not branding of cattle, but it's branding of the devices. Uh, we learned how uh, they overlap and uh, how we can support the authority in FirstNet and especially how we as PSAC members can help drive adoption of the network and of its success, and, and that was one of the key points that, were, that we took from the meeting, is that we need to be actively involved as PSAC members in helping the network succeed with our association members. Uh, we continue to provide uh, use cases and examples of FirstNet in action, real time, uh, and remain dedicated to supporting this outreach uh, and engagement effort in our association. Uh, I think the topics that were discussed were amazing. Uh, we also received an update from PSCR, which was interesting, about their prize challenges and grants. And we also discussed the latest activities of our tribal working group. The tribal working group is currently the only working group that we have. And their, their report continued, uh, gave us updates on uh, the right-of-way uh, permitting challenges and brainstorming potential new topics. Then we continued by brainstorming conventional new topics for our webinar series. And so if you go to the last slide that I have, our uh, webinar series, I really want to extend my appreciation and thanks to the board and the Public Safety Advisory Committee for their interest and attendance at our past webinar series of topics which included the mission critical push to talk, the apps catalog, subscriber paid devices, and we look forward to having uh, any of the board members who would like to uh, join us on our future webinars. The next one is Tuesday, June 26th from 3 to 4, and it's going to be on network status tools. You can also see that in July we're going to talk about quality and service, priority preemption, 
In August, we're going to do incident management, the uplift request tool. In September, the Internet of Things. And then we thought we should take a moment in October or November to do a year-end review. We've had a lot of success. We've had some changes. We've had uh, opportunities. So we thought it would be nice on a webinar to just kind of do a year-end review of what we've done. Uh, and then in December, we'll have our in-person meeting. And as you can see, January, we have ICAM uh, scheduled for that. So. Huge thanks to AT&T, FirstNet Authority staff for their support and help in preparing these webinars. Uh, that was one of the highlights of our uh, June meeting was the members of the PSAC expressing how much they appreciated and learned from these webinars. So uh, it's been very successful. With that, uh, I just want to... On behalf of the PSAC and Executive Committee, thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you. And I don't know if you have any questions for me, but I'm happy to answer any. You know, Paul, just uh, just one comment. Uh, Paul uh, indicated you you are invited as board members to attend these, and I will tell you, having attended them, and a couple of us have, uh, very instructive to hear the questions from public safety. There's only one requirement: no talking. You have to be on mute. This is a call for public safety. And so we were given instructions by Chief Johnson, you can join, but you can't say anything. So, um, but I think it's, Neil, you've been on them. I think Ed's been on them. A couple of you, I think Tip, you've been on a couple of them. Um, it's very, very instructive because we get to go deeper on the topic and really understand what's on the mind of public safety. So. Uh, uh, it, it, it really is. It, it, it provides that uh, diverse background. Uh -huh. because uh, those of us on the uh, wireless side and the networks versus those that are in public safety during the first responder, when you listen and, and you learn, but you, you hear their concerns and their issues and how they need technology, and then we get to see where technology is headed and how we can guide that to solve some of these issues. And it, it's, a, it's it really works well because, you know, Two minds are better than one, and when you get diverse minds, it makes it yeah. better. Yeah, no, it's, it's a. I'm really glad that we started this. I appreciate all the work that the technical staff, you know, because it's a lot of work for you guys to do that. But I really also appreciate the way you engage public safety in this in this dialogue. It's not a presentation, it's a little bit of information, and it's really much more dialogue about this. It's really, really a productive session. So I think that was a good move. Any other comments or questions um, for Paul? I, I just ahead, make a comment. I think the, um, this is a, an important topic, and you and I have talked about it simply. I think when we talk about outreach within the organization, um, our minds tend to go to, okay, do we understand how we're going to sort of persuade people that this is the right solution for, mm -hmm. this, for their organization? Mm -hmm. For us, that's not really our responsibility. Our responsibility, I think, is more to understand what the public safety community needs the network to be able to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, what they see developing the right way and what they see maybe not developing the right way. Right. There aren't very many ways to get that information. Right. This is one way to get it. Exactly. Um, and it, it's a way for us then to oversee the execution of this project by at t mm -hmm. in a way that's directly responsive to what the users are saying rather than the broader contractual language or the sort of high level guidance that we give them as board members. So right. um, I would like to see more people participating in these and really yeah. listening and taking notes and then feeding that back in to our efforts uh, to develop the network because that's what our responsibility is. It's not to sell the network, it's to develop it. And in fact, I think I, I remember on the last call, I think probably than all of them, Jeff, is uh, AT&T usually had a, somebody on the call as well. So it was Brian and then Scott Agnew. Correct. <coughs> they were on the call together. So, yeah. so we right. try to pair it up with, so AT&T is hearing it directly as well. It's not just it's not so I think that's good. Absolutely. We yeah. partnered with the AT&T side that yeah. are really the product managers right. with some of these key efforts exactly. in the first net network. Uh, and to Tip's point, right. absolutely getting that public safety feedback on, well, it would be better if we could do yeah. this right. or this. That's how we're driving the continuous uh, innovation. Yeah. yeah, good. Anything else? Um, of course, we can't do anything without numbers uh, and money. <laughs> and so it's appropriate that we get an update uh, here from uh, from Ed Horowitz and Kim Farrington. So Ed, I'll turn it over to you, and then I think you're going to have Kim update us on a few items. Yes, thank you, Sue. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to echo the sentiment that has been expressed 
so eloquently up to this point regarding a visit to the AT&T uh, GNOC, the, uh, the, the device, uh, you know, assessments and, and certifications, this, the core coming online, uh, the interaction with the PSAC and the PSCR conference which we attended last week, um, and then, of course, the outreach campaigns that, that are ongoing. And we, we kind of um, maybe to some extent take for granted that it just all works, but it only works because of the commitment of the individuals, both from within the enterprise and also in the, in the community that we're serving, and also with the support of our vendor. Uh, so with regard to uh, uh, milestones, I would uh, just first indicate that um, in April, FirstNet received the first payment from AT&T, which ensures our financial sustainability. As you know, we've got to be a self-sustained organization, and the way that happens is <clears throat> by AT&T uh, delivering on its promise for payments to us. And then at the same time, FirstNet continues to execute on its financial plan. We approach this in a very fiscally responsible manner. Kim's going to describe that in a second. Um, we've uh, just entered into the fourth quarter of the fiscal year, and now the, the team is gearing up to present the FY 2019 budget recommendations to the Finance Committee in August and to the full board for approval in mid-September. And I look forward to working with Kim and interacting, of course, with, with Mike as he goes through the organization and the team in developing the FY19 budget. So at this point, let me turn it over to Kim for a brief update on the uh, First Net Authority's financial results and a more detailed discussion of the budget formulation timeline. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Ed mentioned, I'll start with giving you an update of where we are currently in our fiscal year 2018 execution. And as you can see from the chart, we are standing at about 56% utilization of our obligations budget to date as of May 31st. And our expense budget we have utilized cumulatively 59.1 million, which equates to about 58% of our utilization. You will notice that these numbers are both below forecast, but we're actually proud of this fact. We have been very good stewards across FirstNet in the use of the funds that we've received. We continue to look for opportunities to find efficiencies, and what you're seeing are the results of that search for efficiencies and the reduction in what we had planned originally to be utilizing through May 31st. We are working on contracts and reducing the contract amounts as we're uh, recompeting these new contracts. We're also bringing functions in-house or finding skill sets within FirstNet currently instead of having to spend more of those funds that we had originally planned uh, in the budget for fiscal year 18. And what does this mean for first responders? It, that's the most significant part of this, um, finding these efficiencies, is every dollar that we do not utilize for our operations, we'll be going back to public safety. And that will just allow us, every dollar we don't spend this fiscal year that we have planned, we'll go back to support our first responders. So moving on to the, looking forward uh, to our fiscal year 2019 budget formulation process, we are currently on track. We are having very good uh, discussions across business units at FirstNet, and we will be presenting the proposed budget to our CEO uh, this week. We are also going to be working with NTIA on the fee review process and also updating NTIA and the Department of Commerce as we do every year. I'd say that the key items or tasks 
that we have planned for this group are the last four items on this project timeline. Uh, as Ed mentioned, the Finance Committee will be seeing the, the fiscal year 19 formulation proposed budget around August 3rd. We'll be presenting the budget to NCIA and the Department of Commerce around August 10th. The budget will be presented to the entire Finance Committee August 14th with the full board seeing it and approving it, hopefully, at our September board meeting. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Just a clarification, uh, because I think uh, you talked about the money not spending and how important that is to make sure that we're efficient. Um, when we don't spend it, we don't lose it. Correct. Okay, so I think, I think that's important to understand that, that if we don't spend it this year, it's available then for investment in public safety. I didn't want public safety to be expecting their checks. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I just think it's important because we're a little bit different in that, that we don't have to go through this annual cycle. Um, and so if we don't spend it it's available for investment and as Very good right. clarification. <laughs> I, I can see my getting calls saying, where's my check? <laughs> <laughs> Do not go to your mailbox. <laughs> yeah, so so uh, nice work on the on the budget on, on behalf of the whole team because it takes the whole team to make this happen. Absolutely. And so uh, nice work on that on behalf of public safety. So thanks for that. Yeah, and, <laughs> and I'd like to echo that too, uh, Stu. And the other thing is to mention is there's, there's uh, nothing left behind, meaning the, the work that has been um, uh, projected by the budget is taking place. The um, you know, the accomplishments and milestones that were set forth that underlie the budget are taking place. And so the fact that, that the money isn't as much as anticipated is really good, uh, due to the stewardship and uh, and the efforts uh, by the uh, by the company and the, and the leadership. Great. Thank you, Ed. Any other comments or questions about the budget or financial stuff? Um, you know, we often take for granted that the trains keep running on time. And uh, there's a lot of work that goes, probably goes on behind the scenes and it's not as visible as some of these other initiatives. I'm glad we have the opportunity, Rich, to give you an opportunity to tell us how are things are going and from an operations perspective. Having been in uh, similar jobs for most of my career, I can appreciate how much work is involved in this and how you tend to be behind the scenes. So uh, here's an opportunity for you to give us an update on um, how, how we keep the trains running. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the board. Appreciate the opportunity to give you a quick update on management operations in the network. Frankly, we've noticed a, a significant maturity in how the agency interacts with us and how they're interacting with public safety. They're, they're maturing a great deal in both, uh, both of those relationships. We're seeing an improvement in the deliverables that they are delivering to us uh, as a requirement under the contract. And I just want to take a moment to thank AT&T programmatic staff and AT&T technical staff for meeting us in a, a really robust relationship. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of work, heavy lift. Uh, it's a departure from their normal operations and they're appreciative of them. But I also want to thank the first staff, mm -hmm. contractual staff, programmatic staff, technical staff for, for engaging in this heavy lift. Yeah. Reviewing these deliverables, going through these these very lengthy discussions with AT&T on how we're going to monitor this is a, is a heavy lift, so I want to thank them. To give you a quick overview of what we're doing in terms of core uh, network monitoring, as we all know that we do that through the task order three, the third task order we let under the contract. We completed IOC2. It's a phased deployment of the core infrastructure, and we're in the process of uh, looking at drafts of IOC3 under task order three, uh, in early July. There's a very robust application ecosystem out there. There's 23 approved applications that have been through the uh, application review process. There's six still in review actively, and there's 12 that we're still uh, iterating with developers on before they fully enter that review process. Uh, as you mentioned, there's a large ecosystem of devices, as we know, as we went through consultation. Public safety said if you're going to uh, deliver a service, you're also going to have to deliver a robust device ecosystem if we're going to adopt. I think we've achieved that with, with 31 devices approved on the NIST list. Uh, in addition to the certified apps that we talked about, 
ATC has also developed a number of APIs and SDKs uh, available for third-party developers to access. And that functionality includes things like enhanced push-to-talk, SMS, and location-based services. And we're going to continue to evolve those programs uh, over time. In terms of Task Order 4, or the large brand task order, we're in the process of developing a, a coverage verification framework. And I can't tell you how complicated this is doing a nationwide coverage validation process for over 1.75 million square miles. It's a, it's a very, very difficult task, and doing it in a, in a, in a way that's repeatable, verifiable, and, and frankly applicable over the next 24 years is going to be very difficult. So we're in the process of developing that process, as well as making sure that the coverage that we're delivering is commiserate with what we put in the plan or record and what we delivered in terms of state plan. So it's a very complicated process, and the team's doing a great job getting through that with the AT&T. Looking at the finalization of the required requirements traceability matrix, that's the mechanism, the tool we use to monitor those deliverables, and we hope to have the first draft of the IOC1 RTM in June, the end of June, June 22nd to be uh, specific. Moving on to the, the uh, in terms of uh, FirstNet Innovation and Test Lab, I think it was mentioned, but I'll, I'll reiterate, the test lab is fully functional. All of the AT&T Enoby vendors are up and running in the lab, and they're connected to the FirstNet core, so we have a fully operational test lab in, in uh, Boulder, Colorado. And in terms of state plan content, we're continuing to maintain that state plan portal, and we will continue to do that through 2020, and we're doing quarterly updates on that. So that's all the task orders that we're currently monitoring. You said the acronym RTM. I have to that one Requirements Traceability Matrix. Okay. It's, a, it's literally the, the matrix of, of requirements that we agreed to through that negotiation with the AT&T. It's the tool that we use to monitor the deliverables. <laughs> Going on to the next slide. So we're making strong progress with AT&T as we enter the second year of the partnership. We have a live operational network. We have tens of thousands of users, robust deployment of the band 14 spectrum, large number of ENOB is deployed already, and AT&T is really working to uh, speed up the deployment even uh, more quickly than they originally proposed. We, we hope to have IOC2 prior to the March time frame that they, March 19th time frame that they proposed. Um, so we're very, very pleased with that. And that's in addition to, as everyone knows, the QPP-based solution they have on all their LTE fans within their at and network. So it's uh, a very robust availability for public safety today, and they're going to continue to see increases in coverage and increases in functionality as we roll out those band 14 e movies. Um, Finally, we remain flexible. It's, it's very important, I think, that as we engage with at and over the life of this contract, that we're flexible in terms of not being uh, overly draconian in our monitoring of deliverables, flexible in terms of what we see in those deliverables, and frankly, being able to keep up with the evolutions of technology over time. So we're very much uh, in the dialogue with at and around how we're going to evolve our monitoring and, and, frankly, the review of those deliverables over time. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, it's, we talked about all these milestones, and uh, as you can see, the quarterly maintenance are, are indicated. I want to point out the uh, IOC 3 CDR artifacts will be submitted uh, in, in late August. <laughs> and the last thing I'll point out on the deliverable slide here a milestone slide is that we are in the process of receiving our sustainability payments from at and based on the release of past quarter four, and we expect to see that second payment in September. So we have the funding to actually get the mission. So that's all I have. If there's, oh, that's, that's not true. I'll add a couple more things. Sorry. A um, couple things just came in literally while we were sitting here. Uh, I may mention the last board meeting that we had the first 24 uh, deployables being delivered. I did get confirmation we're going to start seeing them this week. Um, they're going to deliver the, the first 24 over the next five weeks. So those first net dedicated deployables are being delivered on time, and uh, I just got that val uh, validation right here in this Great. meeting. Especially with the fire season coming up. Absolutely. <laughs> A couple of other things I'd like to add is 
AT&T has responded to eight, uh, and deployed eight deployables over the last two months, with double what they normally do. And, and, and in terms of response, we think that's a, a really uh, important thing to note that AT&T is keeping that commitment in terms of their response posture. And we and m and uh, are working with TSA as well as AT&T in terms of what we're going to do as an organization in terms of response. Uh, we're developing that organization out. We're going to develop standard, op standard operating procedures mm -hmm. and the operational uh, profiles on how we're going to do that over time. So, right. so you work with people like Fred and um, I can't remember the Fred, Brian, Brian. Um, Jimmy Gill. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. So, so we're going to have staff that are looking at nationwide response yeah. as well as state level response with, uh, with the PSA folks. Yeah, I presume you were pretty happy to see what they're doing with the EOC coordination as well. Yeah, we, we've had several meetings with them, yeah. and I, I'm very, very pleased with the, the level of commitment mm -hmm. I've seen in terms of the response right. posture and how they're going to engage at the state and local level mm -hmm. in terms of meeting public commitment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a real differentiator, frankly, exactly. on how, how public safety are going to view FirstNet as a service. Pretty exciting. Really. Very exciting. Nice to see on schedule and ahead of schedule. We keep you on separate for the entire family. Right. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments? Or, okay. Just one additional uh, capability that a uh -huh. device will now uh, be able to uh, uh, enjoy is that you may not even realize now we're we'll, 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 together on it. But there is going to be times where uh, a first net user is going to have to make an off network, mm -hmm. you know, where you won't have a priority preemption right. for a landline or, or another cellular device. And uh, AT&T is now going to be building wireless priority services. Exactly. So, because there was a big concern by users that they were going to have to have an AT&T phone and a right. first net phone, and you don't have to do that anymore. You just need your first net phone, and, you, and when those times you make an off net call. Yeah, I have a little yeah. plan to thank Ron for, for bringing mm -hmm. that up. Um, we had great meetings with OEC and the team. Uh, AT&T is really the contractor for both of us, so. Uh, we can't tell them what to do on your contract and vice versa, so we had a great joint meeting on how we could bring that WPS capability for that voice priority service on cellular to the FirstNet subscribers, and we're pleased to see that will be uh, added to that one. And it is just for voice, but it is right. that, time of yeah. the, that time when you do have to make Absolutely. an off-net voice call to... Uh, you don't have to do anything special to do it. Start 272. Well, but I mean... <laughs> <laughs> but key point on that is it's when you're going outside the network. It, it makes that into in priority across the other networks. Right. So if you're dialing a hospital landline or right. something like that, you're going to want priority to get there to make sure exactly. that ambulance is ready to Thank you. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll also add, and thanks, Ron, for sharing that. Um, it's, it's no additional cost to first-net subscribers. Right. So the WPS service that OEC generally um, you know, provides to all public safety at all levels of government it's a cost-based service, but right. that's inclusive of our base rate. So it's no additional cost to our customers. We engage with OEC ATT to develop that to ensure that not only do you get priority inside the network on voice and data, but when you're outside the network, you can also achieve that through the WPS service. So it's a really jo great joint uh, solution. Okay. And yeah. thanks to OEC and ATT. I really appreciate you raising it because that's something I think not that many people were aware of. Yeah. Yeah. And really another one that really, really actually helped us driven by public safety feedback as well is, hey, we don't want to, we need it. Exactly. Right. Great. Right. Nice, nice work. Nice work by you and the team. Please thank the team for all your work. It was a team effort. Not too many workers. So um, I think that concludes our um, committee work and other updates. So, Mike, I think you have a few little comments. Just first. a couple, and uh, uh, you've already touched on it. You know, one of the things to remember is uh, this is not a trivial program. There's a lot of moving parts. We make it sound like, you know, it's, it's piece pretty of piece of cake and uh, all that, but the entire organization and the uh, entire, you know, NTIA, Commerce, everyone is leaning forward on this thing. Um, if you consider the core got built, but now there's uh, what I call 55 spinning plates mm -hmm. out there. If you remember the old days, the old uh, five bill shows trying to keep the plates spinning. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more work to do, but we're still very optimistic. And we have the right people in the right places to ensure that, that that is successful, which kind of feeds into our budget process that Ken talked about. We are in now the throes of looking at do we have the right budgetary needs, both staff-wise, 
equipment-wise, application-wise, to be able to support the effort to make sure that the successful build-out of the program is going on. As Kim also talked about, we are very bullish on every dollar that we do spend, so the judicious financial management continues, and it really gets highlighted every year in the summer season. Um, I know my team really enjoys the uh, process where they think I come in like crazy Eddie slashing prices, um, but we want to make sure that we're covering what we need, but every other dollar that we don't need, we save for investment back into the network when it makes sense. Um, you heard also today some of the things from Amanda and the public safety team, advocacy team, about this is live, it's real, and there's real use cases going on. She talked about um, the Boston Marathon and some of the success there in Rhode Island. Uh, what you see up here is a couple of uh, those examples just in, in recent deployments in Ellicott City, Maryland, with the tragic loss of life and the uh, terrible property destruction and flooding. First Net was there to support, and uh, she mentioned in Western Connecticut, which is in the upper right hand, it looks like toothpicks right. just laying on the ground, but those were trees before that storm, you know, ravaged that area. And then as we mentioned, the Boston Marathon, you know, the planning and then nice festivals like in Orm, Utah, which is in the lower right. These are use cases that you're going to start hearing more and more about, but more importantly, these are not going to be the ex uh, exception. They're going to be the expectation of public safety in the user community. As Rich mentioned, there's been a lot of deployments. Um, there's been wildfires in Texas, New Mexico, where the deployables have been going out, and that, that's just becoming standard operating procedure to try to improve the response. So we're very uh, optimistic that uh, you know the right solution at the right time is going to continue to be there. So we're very appreciative of all those efforts. You know, the other thing I want to assure the uh, the board that uh, I'm still very pleased and proud to be part of the organization because the men and women of FirstNet and all the support, they are still very passionate about this mission and very laser focused on its success. Um, you heard from Rich, with, uh, he, you know, he, he glossed over RTM, but you have no idea how involved that is down to the line, making sure that AT&T is delivering what is required. And so I'm very proud. And I want to thank all the team of FirstNet, and I want to also thank their families because there, there's a lot of times it is a family effort to allow their um, uh, employee to come and continue to do the kind of requirements that we have to complete this mission. So uh, um, the board should be very comfortable that you absolutely have the right team. They're very focused and they're going to continue to deliver for, uh, for years to come, so thank you. I also want to um, let the public know that um, there's not going to be a formal Q&A right. during this, but as always, if there's any questions that anyone has from the public or the press or anyone, please get that to us and we will uh, promptly uh, respond to that because we want to make sure that all questions are answered uh, in a timely fashion, but there is not going to be a, uh, a formal Q&A. Right. So with that, uh, um, Madam Chair, we look forward to the, uh, one of my favorite board meetings is every September is trying to get the uh, budget through this board, so uh, we, we will be in touch. <laughs> no, I think that's great. I appreciate it, Mike. Any any uh, comments from the board before we uh, move to adjourn? Um, I, I hope you found it uh, not only useful, but uh, I think encouraging in terms of this is continuing progress at a pretty good clip. Um, you know, this is something that, you know, we didn't just uh, get all the space in and then, you know, wait for another year for something to happen. You can see that there's continued momentum, and I think it's a real uh, testament to both the AT&T team and the personal authority to make these things happen. So a real tribute to the team, and thanks for everything you're doing. With that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second. Thank you. I'm sure there's no objections or um uh, abstention, but uh, could you signify your approval by saying aye? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us, and we will see you in another quarter. <laughs>